Thanks to author Caitlin Hamilton Summy for sponsoring today's episode. Her book, To Lay to Rest Our Ghosts, continues to spark interest in reviews three years after its publication date. It won the Philip H. McGath Book Award and Silver in the Forward Book of the Year Award. This book of stories has resonated widely. Beth Hoffman, author of Saving Cece Honeycutt, said, If I could hand sell this book to everyone I pass on the street, I would. Yes, it's that good. So I hope you will go and check out To Lay to Rest Our Ghosts. The link is in the show notes. This is the Thoughts from a Page podcast, which is now a member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and each episode I interview authors about their latest works. For more book recommendations, check out my earlier episodes and my website, thoughtsfromapage.com, and follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. I want to say a special thanks to several bookstagrammers who shared my podcast recently on social media. Thanks to Katie at Basic Bees Guide, Barrett at Barrett Talks Books, and Jude at NY Judester, who also left me a very nice review. Word of mouth is really helping me grow the show, so know that I very much appreciate the sharing. I also want to give a shout out to my listeners in the Philippines and New Zealand. Thanks to you all. From the beginning, I have been regularly appearing on the Apple podcast charts for both countries. As the podcast keeps growing, I am now showing up in the U.S. and Canada also, which is super exciting, but I always enjoy seeing New Zealand and the Philippines immediately popping up. So thank you. Today, I am interviewing Sanjana Sethian about Gold Diggers, a Paul and Daisy Soros fellow. Sanjana is a 2019 graduate of the Ohio Writers Workshop. She has worked as a reporter in Mumbai and San Francisco with nonfiction bylines for The New Yorker, The New York Times, Food and Wine, The Boston Globe, The San Francisco Chronicle, and more. And her award-winning short fiction has been published in Boulevard, Joyland, Salt Hill, and The Master's Review. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks, AG1, for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Sanjana. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to have you and to talk all about gold diggers. Yeah, me too. Well, why don't we start out with you just telling me a little bit about the book? Sure. So Gold Diggers is kind of a magical, realist, immigrant family novel. It follows a 15-year-old boy, he's 15 when the novel starts, named Neil, who lives in this suburb of Atlanta, Georgia, where I grew up. And his whole community, he lives in this kind of Indian and Asian American bubble. And his whole community has just really high expectations for academic achievement. But Neil himself feels like he's falling short of those expectations. He feels like sort of an underachiever. And that's making him really lonely. He discovers, though, that his neighbor and childhood best friend and longtime crush, Anita, who is doing really well and seems like one of the kind of golden children of the community, he discovers that she and her mother are stealing gold from other Indians in the community. And instead of kind of turning it into cash, they are transmuting it in this little ritual and turning it into a magical elixir that allows them to steal the ambitions and energies of the gold's original owners. And Neil kind of gets involved in that plot and goes from being a character who's an underachiever to doing well and becoming sort of addicted to ambition itself. 
The novel follows these characters through their kind of teenage years in 2006 Georgia, and then picks up again 10 years later in 2016 Silicon Valley. And it has these cutaways to 1849 Gold Rush, California, and 1980s Bombay, which is where Anita's mother grew up and kind of came of age herself. You cover a lot in this book. So how did you come up with the various ideas and then meld them into this story? I wanted to write a novel about the suburbs of Atlanta for a while. I think I started my first couple of attempts about eight years ago. I had recently come to terms with the fact that I am a child of the suburbs and that that was going to be my material and I was going to try to make literature out of it. But my first couple of attempts were just not very good. They were very somber realism. I wasn't having that much fun writing them. And so I picked up again kind of five years after that when I I didn't know that I was trying to write the same novel again. Instead, I found a way in because I was really interested in this spate of gold thefts that happened in Atlanta when I was growing up. And these thefts kind of happened all over the country. Basically, any time you find Indians in the suburbs, you find gold thefts and a lot of gold. And the reason is we keep too much in the house and it's not totally secure enough. So Uh, Not to give anyone any ideas. (laughs) There'll be a whole new rush now of gold thefts. (laughs) I know. I feel bad. I want everyone to be like, I want everyone to take this as a sign to better secure their gold before they they are targeted again. But exactly. um, You know, my my mother loves a good yarn. She loves mafia and mob stories. And I remember her saying, like, mark my words, there are Indians involved in this because these thieves, they know exactly where to go in the house to get the gold. And so I thought about what it would be like to be a member of this community who is also kind of turning on the community. And I came up with the idea of a mother and a daughter who were slightly outcast from their own community, a mother who is living separated from her husband. And so people are kind of judging her for that. And I I really got the novel in its current form when I had the gold thefts, I had the magic realism, and then I met kind of in my head the narrator, Neil. And discovered that he was going to be a really useful vehicle for exploring the story. He isn't the one who's doing the gold thefts at the start. He gets to discover them. And that's really useful as like an author to have a character who's kind of new to a world that you can explore the story through their eyes. But more than anything, Neil had a voice that just felt like it was my voice. And I just felt like I was free to write for the first time in my life. It just felt like me. Well, that's interesting, the idea that Neil will be coming across a story just as the reader will be. So it makes him a great narrator because we're learning what he's learning. Yeah, that's sort of a classic thing that if you go back and look at a lot of novels that that everyone loves, you sort of start to realize like that is a trick. It's also quite common in, you know, like fantasy and science fiction, which is not what this book is. But I learned some things from that that you you want to have new kid on the block energy uh, in order to kind of have all of your inciting incidents and get the action going. It works well because the reader sort of likes to be learning as the main character is learning. You did a lot of research for the book and you include a list at the end. How did you decide you know, what you were going to look at and what was your favorite part of researching? So I did basically three kinds of research. In one kind, I talked to my uncle for about two or three hours He lived the experience of attending the school that a bunch of the characters who are in the sort of flashback sections attend, the Indian Institutes of Bombay, the Indian Institutes of Technology. And talking to him gave me some insight into what the backstory, the history of these people who came to America could be. So that was really fun. The second kind of research I did was into alchemical traditions. So I read a lot about alchemy in China, in India, in Europe. And I did this not to get the actual magical device. I already had in mind that these people were going to steal and drink gold. But researching alchemy gave me a sense of what gold has meant to people culturally and socially and spiritually through the centuries. It has always compelled the human imagination because it's this unvarnished metal that can survive a lot. And so just doing that research, it helped me with a couple of subplots in the book, but really that was there to give me a sense of everything gold is capable of. The last chunk of research I did was into the California gold rush, which people are familiar with. You know, it's a core part of America's like self-mythologizing. 
But what I what I didn't know at the start, I mean, I, I had a sense that the gold rush was an international phenomenon. You hear about Chinese laborers and you know Chileans and Australians and all these people arriving in California for the gold rush. But I had wondered if there were ever any Indians who came to the U.S. during the gold rush. And I kind of went looking for that because my characters in it are Indian. And I thought it might be cool to have some historical kind of progenitor for them. But I didn't find any Indians in the gold rush for a long time. And I was sort of on the verge of giving up when I found this German travelogue uploaded to the Library of Congress archives. And at the end of this short little travelogue was a story just called The Hindu. And it was about an Indian in the gold rush. It was actually a very dark story because it was about this German man and a few other people who came across this Indian man accused him of stealing gold and sort of formed an impromptu like vigilante justice squad that threatened to turn into a lynch mob. And I became very compelled by this story of this kind of solo Indian adventurer in the midst of this deeply American moment in history. And I kept trying to find more proof that he existed. And I just couldn't find it. And I ended up giving that experience of trying to chase down a figure in history to my narrator, Neil. You know, he encounters the story of the Hindu almost exactly as I did in the first half. He learns about it from an old man who's reading a bunch about history in part one. And then in part two, he becomes a PhD student studying history. And he tries to corroborate the story of this Indian man. And he just can't find it. and. At first, when I had that experience, I was like, okay, this ruins the book. You know, I can't, I can't tell the story. I wanted it to be this 60 page chunk in the middle of the book. And then I realized that my own feelings and frustrations and sadnesses about not being able to find this man could be part of the book because ultimately that is the experience of looking for yourself in American history if you have always existed at the margins. And so the book ends up kind of commenting upon how hard it is to locate yourself in American history if basically you're not white. I love that you took that story that began as a frustrating thing, like I've got this one person, I can't find any proof of it, and instead just ended up channeling it through Neil. That is a great way to have used that. I think that you always find when you're writing that the problems you run into in the process of writing actually become part of the novel. You kind of incorporate that into the novel. And that's that's kind of a fun trick for anyone listening who is stuck on a problem if they if they happen to be writing. Just make it part of the narrative. I agree with that. And I hear authors say that pretty often, that sometimes the thing that is the most frustrating ends up being flipped around and becoming one of your favorite parts of the story or just some something that readers are commenting on regularly or whatever it is, that you can use it in a positive way. It just sometimes takes a way of reframing it for yourself. Exactly. Right, right into the problem. Exactly. Well, I'd like to talk more about the, what you're talking about before identity. So your story is a coming of age story, but it's also an identity story. Do you want to talk some about that? Sure. I mean, those two things aren't really separated for me because I think if you are a minority, you, your coming of age is about your identity, whether you want it to be or not. These are teenagers in the start of the book and in the second half, they're in their 20s. And they actually grow up in kind of an Indian American bubble. So there are other people like them around, but they're surrounded by whiteness and by an awareness that they are in the minority. And that's kind of how I grew up. And the novel both is frustrated by the fact that it has to deal with identity and also does deal with identity. In in the first half, some of the characters compete in this uh, Miss Teen India beauty pageant, which is a real thing. And in this beauty pageant, they're always being asked to say, what does it mean to be both Indian and American? And this is sad, right? Like, this is not a question that I actually think is productive. I think it's an incredibly superficial question because it reduces and boils down identity to just national identity. And what I tried to explore in the book is this idea that all identity, even if it starts in culture, even if it starts in ethnicity and starts in race, it all sort of has something to do with a deeply private experience of just trying to understand who you are apart from social norms and apart from who your family says you are and who society says you are. And so I think the characters are, as you say, 
both just trying to grow up and also figuring out how to grow up within the confines of their cultural identity. I mean, a passage that has been really connecting with people that came quite late in the process is one where Neil, the narrator, says that he and other second generation immigrants are conceptual orphans because they don't know what it means to just grow up in America. They don't have enough pictures of what life here can be like. And I I reached that passage really late because I didn't realize that that's what the the book was about until I had some really smart questions from my editor and I realized, oh, this is a story of people not just growing up, but people growing up who have a restricted imagination of how to be American. Well, and they're not seeing themselves reflected everywhere, which is what you're saying. You know, if you grow up, as I did, as a white teenager, you're seeing yourself reflected everywhere, and it's easy to sort of envision these different things. But I think it's becoming a very common conversation now, which it should have been years ago, but at least it's beginning to be discussed more, that we need to have better representation of everyone in magazines and TV and newspaper, wherever else, so that whoever you are, you're seeing yourself reflected different places. Yeah. And I think the representation conversation is helpful. I think it's also sort of like, you know, artistically, aesthetically and politically insufficient. It's, it's something that I have a few frustrations over because it's like, it's a starting point, right? But I think it, it matters not just to see oneself, but to have the ability to just spread. So, so you can take yourself for granted. And that begins with representation, but I worry about what I see as kind of mere representation. Another thing that I think about in that regard is I don't want people in my community to be just looking for themselves and then saying, oh, look, here, we're here. We're here on TV. We're here in politics. Great. We've arrived. End of story. I think what has to happen now is we have to think about what it means to be a part of America or at least a little bit more American than maybe we were treated some years ago. Um, What happens if you have been an outsider like I have, and now you're increasingly something more like an insider? It's the question of not just representation, but assimilation and the responsibilities that come on the other side of assimilation. We are still often treated as the perpetual foreigners. And so sometimes we're insiders, and then sometimes we're shunted back outside to be outsiders. But I want people in the community to think about the responsibilities, um, which is kind of a refrain in the second half of the book. These characters were outsiders in their suburb of Atlanta. And then all of a sudden, they're doing well in Silicon Valley. They're tech whizzes. They have money. And so they're asking themselves, what do we do with all we took? Right. No, and I agree with you. I mean, those are very good points. I guess my point was you've got to start somewhere. And so at least the conversations are beginning. And once you get started with that, then yes, eventually, and and quickly, it would be nice if everybody just was viewing themselves the same versus worrying about identifying somebody as Indian American or Chinese American or just, you know, we're American. And I think that there's a long way to go, but I hope that people are beginning to understand that it's very important to get outside your bubble. Starting point for sure. Well, now you were a journalist for a while, correct? I was, yeah, for about five years. So how does that impact your writing now? I learned a lot from it. I feel like journalists have to get outside themselves. They learn a lot in a short period of time about a lot of different topics. And for someone who grew up, as I did, with sort of this limited picture of the country, journalism expanded my understanding of the world. And that was just so valuable. It just felt like I got a lot of life experience in those five years by listening to other people's life experiences. The other thing that journalism makes you do is kind of in addition to being an antidote to your own narcissism, it can be really good for understanding readers and like keeping readers in mind. I think no one line edits you in fiction the way they do in journalism. I have memories of sitting next to editors who were just demanding so much clarity and uh, communication from each writer. And I, I have an editor who would always just say, you know, be kind to the reader. Like, assume your reader is smart. Assume your reader cares about the world. You don't have to talk down to your reader, but invite them in, make them want to stay, make them want to keep reading. And I think journalism was really good for me for that. Well, and I think also journalism really focuses on 
using just the right words, you know, sparingly telling the story versus being flowery and including a lot of extra words. So the ability to pare down what you want to say and get your point across and as few words as possible. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's that's the Hemingway thing, right? Don't adorn things. I think one thing that has been fun about switching back into fiction is I get to do things with sentences that no one would have let me do in journalism. I get to riff and go longer, but I still keep what you're saying, that kind of core of keep it simple, keep it clear, even as I get a little more adorning. Get to embellish a little bit. Exactly. Well, I'm dying to hear about how you have Mindy Kaling developing gold diggers into a TV series. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, I learned last summer that Mindy Kaling's production company, Kaling International, was interested in optioning the novel. And it was really kind of surreal to be told that I was going to get on a phone call uh, and hear her voice in real life. So cool. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And she's kind of a comic genius and kind of to that point about representation, like one thing that she did was she didn't just put us on the screen. She put a really funny, extremely irreverent version of the South Asian diaspora on screen. I remember watching, you know, the the Diwali episode of The Office where, you know, she wasn't there to stand for Indian Americans. She was just there to play within a world that was already Indian American. It's that kind of subtle difference that I remember seeing in her work and being like, she's doing something new. So I don't think there's anyone better to get to work with on the adaptation. I am co-writing it with um, someone who we're going to find soon. We're interviewing people. And it's a long way to actually go from an option to getting the thing made. But I'm hopeful that if we do do it, there will be a lot new that we can try. The novel is written in first person, but it has quite a wide cast of characters. So I'll be able to explore new kind of worldviews from each character. It also will just like get to be playful in the way contemporary television is. It's just so artful these days. So I'm I'm really excited about that. I think the other cool thing is going to be that there are so many Indian and Asian American characters in the book who get to take up space. And, you know, every time we see Asian characters on television, so often they're token, they're in the margins. And that's changed. You know, people totally lost it over Crazy Rich Asians because there were, it was just, you know, an all Asian cast. And Mindy's last show, Never Have I Ever, on Netflix. That also put people of color kind of in the spotlight and not in the margins. And we're going to get to have like a pretty heavily minority cast if this does get made. And that will be cool to give a new set of actors just a lot more opportunities. And to then again, it's not just mere representation, but it's it's a host of, of rich stuff. So super exciting all around. That's just very cool. And you know Mindy Kaling will handle it all well and it will be done in a fun, creative way because she's just fantastic. She's really great. Yeah. Well, I always love to talk about titles and covers. That's one of my favorite things to hear about. And I feel like your title has several meanings. How did it come about? Yeah, I get to titles pretty early. I know not every writer is like that. But for me, a title is kind of an organizing principle for a book. I don't exactly remember when I got the title, but I I know it came pretty early. And I was interested in the mother character, Anjali, being called a gold digger at some point. I knew that was going to be kind of meaning number one. And then the novel also, as you say, explores the idea of gold diggers in the literal sense. It's like, okay, we're in the California gold rush and people were literal gold diggers in that (laughs) moment. But then I also kept pushing on this idea, and I was thinking about how being a gold digger is sort of more about need and security and trying to find a home for yourself when you don't necessarily have access to all of that power and privilege on your own. And so the the novel then kind of becomes about that. It's not just about people stealing and taking what doesn't belong to them rightfully, but it's about asking why they do that and trying to find sympathy and empathy for that. So titles are really fun for me too, because you get to explore a concept from a ton of different angles. Well, and I think it's so great when a title like yours has several meanings, ties in very clearly to your story, but also when you look at it, you're thinking it, you know, there's several layers there. And I, I just think that's so much fun. 
Thank you. I'm so glad you liked it. One of my favorite things to ask authors is what they've read recently that they really liked. So what have you read that you would recommend? Yeah, well, I have been lucky enough to actually read a few of my friends' books that are coming out in 2022 to give them an early shout. Sarah Thunka Matthews has a book coming out with a Viking next year called All This Could Be Different. And it's a very beautiful coming of age story of a bunch of friends in Milwaukee. And it's about kind of what it takes to make it in your 20s. And in that sense, it's really about capitalism, all these kids just trying to scrape by. It's also just a wonderful like queer coming of age story that I think we need more of. And again, just just explores it from a lot of different angles. Another friend of mine, Lee Cole, has just a stunning novel coming out with not that's called Groundskeeping. And it's about a groundskeeper at a small southern college who begins to have an affair with the local writer in residence. And it's about his own coming of age as a writer. But it has just wonderful kind of meandering musings on the South and about education itself. I'm also right now reading The Four Books by Yen Lian Ke, which is a political satire of China's Great Leap Forward that is totally brilliant. Well, I always love hearing about books that are coming out in the future because then I know to check them out and try to get a hold of a galley and stuff. So thank you for talking about some that won't be out till next year. That's always fun. Definitely keep an eye out for, for Sarah and Lee. They're both so brilliant. I certainly will. Sanjana, thank you so much for joining me today on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. Thank you, Cindy. I appreciate the thoughtful questions. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you liked this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts From a Page. Tell all of your friends about the podcast and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. Sanjana's book can be purchased at the Conversations From a Page bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I want to give a special thanks to Caitlin hamilton Summy and to Lay to Rest Our Ghosts for sponsoring this episode. I hope you'll tune in next time. Hi there, I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. So while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardknowpodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no.